People's Green New Deal was a response to the larger discussion which emerged starting in 2018 about a Green New Deal. The Green New Deal emerged actually starting in the, in the end of the 2000s and was about this idea of uh, ecological conversion of the U.S. industrial plant and as it uh, gestated in the U.S. Congress, it was an idea for both an ecological construction or reconstruction of the U.S. industrial plant, along with progressive social policy and a progressive jobs policy. So it was really domestically oriented, and it was about uh, demand management and green anti-racist uh, Keynesianism, basically. My proposal uh, or my ideas or my thinking about a Green New Deal is that if, if the if there is going to be a progressive green domestic social policy in a country that is very involved through uh, imperialism in the rest of the world, then it should take the rest of the world's demands and needs into account as they were articulated in historic documents and convenings uh, of the third world, for example, from the Cochabamba People's Agreement. And this is especially important insofar as people are saying a Green New Deal is the same as something called eco-socialism. So if it's going to be called eco-socialism, in my opinion, it should in fact be eco-socialist in the sense that it should really aspire to making a just world for everybody who's living on the world. The essence of the Cochabamba People's Agreement was to turn this idea of the ecological crisis, which of course has been known about since the, the 1970s at least as a worldwide phenomenon, and to make clear that the ecological crisis, first of all, should not be resolved on the back of the poorer people of the world, and that second of all, it should in fact deal with the legacies and the ongoing uh, debts and also ongoing damages linked to colonialism, neo-colonialism, and imperialism. So departing from that basis, it worked through a variety of sectors, technology, forests, food sovereignty, uh, armed conflict, and essentially calls for uh, demilitarization, it calls for a worldwide developmental convergence, and one of the most important elements of that that really speaks to the discussions that need to ha be, ha be had amongst politically active-minded people in the global north is this question of climate debt. So the Cochabamba People's Agreements said that the climate debt uh, which is actually only a part of the broader uh, colonial reparations, in fact, but that the climate debt, also the set of things that are owed from the North to the South as it relates to the climate is around 6% of Northern uh, GNP, that that amount of funds should be channeled annually from the North to the South. So for a country like the United States, it's $1.3 trillion. For the countries of the OECD, it's around $3.2 trillion. And if you look at the accumulated climate debt, it's uh, something between, uh, depending on how much you value a ton of carbon, between 110 and $460 trillion. So it's actually not a lot if you think about it in terms of the percent as a percentage of the accumulated debt, it's one percent, right? Or it's like uh, it's three percent, one one to three percent of the accumulated debt yearly. That's actually not a lot if you think about things in terms of uh, interest rates and so forth. So it's about the idea that our because the world system is uh, is not a just world system, and because there was a legacy of colonialism that created the world system as it currently exists, then we as people who believe in a just world system need to be ha having a serious discussion about remedies for the actions that have created an unjust world system. I decided to write the book in part because I was in fact facing a bit of an intellectual blockade when it came to uh, getting certain ideas out around the Green New Deal. And 
there were uh, certain forums, certain publications that were stating, first of all, uh, that the Ocasio-Cortez Green New, New Deal, for example, was a socialist. And this, sh in fact, is a distortion of just simply what the Ocasio-Cortez Green New Deal actually is. Uh, second of all, um, it, I, and I faced a lot of difficulty in pushing forward uh, an alternative line. And I said, OK, this is actually a very a moment where the discussion about climate is take going in certain directions and it's going in uh, directions away from where uh, the people I work with and the people I'm in struggle with uh, and I would want it to go. And therefore, I should try and uh, take some time to intervene in the debate and try to put forward ideas which more historically, which reflect the historic demands that uh, could orient towards a more just world for the entire planet and not just a cleaner and more progressive world for people in the in Europe and the United States. And I and finally, I think the the idea of the Green New Deal has really captured attention. Uh, and has kind of set the parameters for the discussion about progressive environmental politics. Okay, so then it uh, was necessary, I think, to enter that debate and say, okay, this is, uh, it's valid. Of course, it's good that the ecology and the environment are finally on the world uh, agenda and the agenda of progressive or left or Marxist people. That's, of course, a good thing, but it should be there are certain ground rules or certain parameters we should respect when we have this conversation. The conversation is not coming from nowhere, right? There have been conversations about the environment before, and there have been conversations that have included many, a much broader range of people than people just living in places like New York and London and San Francisco, right? That's not the majority of the planet. And so let us go back to those documents uh, and learn something from them and say, those people were put forward demands that we, in fact, need to make the foundation of how we think about reconstructing what's going uh, the the forms of production, the property relationships, and uh, uh, re the technologies of production in Europe and, and the United States. One is that the so what shouldn't be reduced to my opinion, right? In the sense that uh, the, the, the text of the Ocasio-Cortez Green New Deal is not uh, anti-capitalist. In fact, it doesn't really pretend to be anti-capitalist. Um, and it doesn't call for things like climate debt repayments. It doesn't call for demilitarization. Just the most basic things that are necessary in order to achieve a just world. So uh, a more radical program is just a program that uh, reflects the needs of most of humanity and things that most of humanity needs in order to have a decent world. The U.S. should not be spending any money on its military and should be offering capital grants to countries like Honduras or Nicaragua, where the military has been used to historically for not, the U.S. military has been used for not uh, very harmful things in the past, right? So this is one, uh, one aspect of it. How should it be implemented? How it should be implemented is that it would be fantastic if social movements like Extinction Rebellion or um, or whatever comes next uh, and flows out from Extinction Rebellion with all of its limits, um, or if the local chapters of something like the Sunrise Movement, or um, it, although it also too the the national leadership is not uh, is thoroughly corrupt, but if if or youth or anti-imperialist groups. Uh, essentially included demands for climate debt and also included, uh, focused a lot more on agriculture and in their demands that, that they mobilize around. Uh, the specific strategy of that is very difficult. I mean, if to achieve a strategy for a national or international ecological reconstruction of our world system requires a lot of thinking and a lot of people and a lot of stitches to bring together, uh, scattered pieces of social struggles where everyone is working more or less, for the most part, in isolation. So there's people focused on carbon drawdown, and there's people focused on moves to renewable energy, and there's people 
is focused on transition. And there's the food sovereignty movement in North America, and there's a food sovereignty movement in Europe. And formally, they can be connected through La Via Campesina to food sovereignty movements in uh, Latin America, where they have uh, plans for climate change that I very much drew upon. And then there's indigenous groups in the United States who are focused on, have lots of plans for climate change uh, historically and in the present moment, like the Karuk Declaration and more recently the Red Deal. So these uh, struggles need to converge around a common program. And I would not say that this is my common program that they should converge around. Rather, what I wrote is hopefully offers some intellectual resources towards the forging of a common program. Um, and then decide what is your strategy to achieve it. Uh, if I had a strategy to achieve it, I would uh, probably not be doing YouTube interviews and would instead be uh, leading a program for progressive social change on a and on an international scale, so it's not my specialty. It, the problem is different in different locations. I think uh, if you take uh, the entire spectrum of progressive, uh, radical, socialist, communist people in the uh, Europe and the United States who are the primary audience for this book, probably, although, of course, uh, it's being read in, in the South and the Philippines and Tunisia and so forth, then the, the primary obstacles are, one, uh, an investment in short-term electoral politics, uh, an overestimation of the electoral route to social change, uh, uh, and a disinterest in independent uh, political and social mobilization. So the dominant routes to trying to change the world that have prevailed in Europe and the United States have been uh, often ideologically uh, incoherent uh, social democratic parties, right? Bernie Sanders insurgency, the Corbyn insurgency, in Europe, uh, Syriza and uh, in Spain, Podemos and uh, the movements in uh, France around the Mélenchon and and so forth. This strategy is not working. This strategy has been totally uh, dismantled and eradicated and uh, put down by people who uh, from the ruling class who are not accepting any challenge to the way the world currently works. So there needs to be something else. Uh, there needs to be, uh, uh, it's, and it's not just that there needs to be something else. Everyone kind of agrees there should maybe be something else. But what is the nature of that something else? And how is that going to differ from a short-term investment in electoral politics as the route of change? I mean, how does one achieve permanent social transformation is obviously not, in my opinion, by electing handfuls or larger handfuls of progressive legislators in uh, in parliaments and in Congress, right? You need, first of all, you need, so, so I think you need social movements that emerge from their, orga their organic logic and that have an autonomous logic about the world they want to see that do not accept the rule of imperialism and capitalism within our world and say, we don't accept that this is the way the, way the world has to work. We want the world to work a different way. That is very feasible for people on a large scale to come together in movements, at least, if not organized parties, um, and say, we want the world to work differently. Um, so it's, it's but the, and the two are intermingled. People who say, think that the world cannot work differently, or, or it's very, it's too hard to really make the world work differently are also people who are inclined to think that you can make the world just a little bit better by voting in Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders or what have you. So there's uh, there's an obstacle that people, a lot of, too many people who we need to be uh, supporting the idea that the world can change radically are too invested in the idea that the world should only change moderately. So this idea needs to be broken apart. And part of that is showing that if you want everyone in the world to have a good life, then the world does need to change radically, right? 
then the world does need to have demands for climate debt and uh, and it included in the programs for a green, a green new deal and th as I, uh, I and I, I neglected to respond to an earlier uh, question sub question of yours which was that most of the progressive proposals for a green new deal including luminaries of the climate movement right like Naomi Klein are not focused on climate debt, even though Naomi Klein in 2010 called the Cochabamba People's Agreement a transformative proposal and fully endorsed it, and now she is silent about it. Now, I'm not interested in why Naomi Klein went from praising it as the most transformative to being silent about it. Uh, what I'm interested in is that if people who are invested in a transformation to a just social and ecological world system are say, agreed that climate debt is a fundamental, non-optional component of that. And I think that is one of several demands, for example, things like agrarian reform, things like uh, national uh, free decommodified health care and housing in North and South. These are fundamental planks that need to be incorporated into uh, the struggle for a better world for everybody. So I, I hope the book popularizes uh, some of the Im most important uh, issues that, that it really focuses on. I think it, I hope it popularizes this idea of uh, climate debt payments as a fundamental non-optional component of climate activism. I hope it clarifies to people that uh, active support for the sovereignty uh, which doesn't have to mean any particular government. It means the sovereignty of governments in the third world to determine their own path and to be aware that governments in the north are blocking that sovereignty to fully support all the remaining struggles for decolonization, which includes the settler states, which includes indigenous movements like the Sami in Europe, uh, which includes uh, completing decolonization in Namibia, which is still where most of the land is still owned by uh, white people are in South Africa, uh, which means, uh, of course, decolonization in Palestine, um, uh, United States, Canada. So it means completing the struggle for uh, for decolonization. I th uh, I want people to understand that uh, although it's far, not everyone needs to be a farmer, but everyone needs to support a conversion to ecological forms of farming or agroecology on a world scale. Uh, and this is very important if you want to pull down carbon and if you want to uh, protect biodiversity. You need, uh, you need uh, uh, an ecologically literate management of the landscape that is not uh, input intensive. I hope it gets people to think a little more creatively about things like infrastructure and construction and manufacturing and industrialization and to see that the answer of industrialization to any given problem is not an answer at all, while at the same time, the, uh, the, uh, the reverse coin of that, of rejecting industrialization, is also not an answer. The question is controlling industrialization and making industrialization a uh, means to producing uh, the things people need uh, on the widest possible scale and without damaging the ecology, and so those need to be uh, both the ambitions of industrialization and the constraints around industrialization. And it's just not the answer to every one of the world's problems um, to use metal and uh, burn coal in order if we have need something. Um, and so I think this is, should be widespread. And finally, I hope that uh, people are aware of what the agenda is coming from uh, the ruling class, but also coming from uh, reformist social democrats and to see that those plans are inadequate to the scale of the challenge. And some of them are extremely dangerous. Some are uh, only mildly dangerous, uh, but uh, none of them are adequately resp responding to the scale of the challenge or on, on an ecological or a social level if we accept that the society that deserves to have a good life is this whole world rather than just people uh, in the global north.